we spent just uh, so much time covering the key terms that I never really got to talk about some of the things in module six that I, that uh, from my perspective, from my uh, background in physics and actually the topic that was uh, part of my uh, research project when I was a graduate student. I never got to talk about any of that stuff. So um, I just want you to uh, find some time to do that, which I guess is today. <laughs> so, um, and there are some hint of that in module six as uh, you are reading, as you are maybe flipping through these slides. Um, well, this is the hint of that. And uh, from my perspective, it's, uh, um, it's the biggest uh, supporting point for the standard model uh, Big Bang cosmology. And um, I think I've um, shown some aspects of that on Wednesday uh, based on you know, the Hubble's uh, observation of the expanding universe and uh, cosmic microwave background. And um, this uh, third thing I'm bringing up, it has a, a connection to particle physics. And I um, think these uh, slides I don't, I don't remember if they come from the same section. I think they should be coming from section 29.3. Um, let me see if, uh, um, let me see if uh, <laughs> that, uh, what it is. And uh, I actually do mention this uh, right at the top in the intro for the module. And uh, this is the key phrase that, um, oops, this is key phrase I give you, and it's the, um, well, that's how I kind of remember the topics as a Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. And uh, this goes to the Wikipedia link, which you can follow if you want to. Um, and within the textbook, if you search for nu uh, nucleosynthesis, it doesn't come up in this context because um, your textbook doesn't use that phrase in that particular context. <laughs> um, so I think you actually have to read through this section carefully to, um, to match up with what I'm talking about here. Um, but both the, the phrase Big Bang Nucleosynthesis and what your textbook will describe, it um, describes the same thing, which is the, uh, which is the um, crea creation or uh, production of isotopes uh, beyond just the hydrogen or, you know, the protons which were around from the very beginning. Um, so production of isotopes beyond the hydrogen that, um, that exists in the universe. And, some of this actually goes way back to, I think, uh, I want to say module one or module two. I guess uh, it was part of the reading that we did when we were doing module one. Um, ah, here it is. Um, in this sense, all of us are literally made of recycled stardust. And uh, what this uh, is referring to is how um, all the nearly all elements you see on earth, particularly carbon, oxygen, all the, uh, all the uh, metallic things and, or, or all the things that astronomers call metal, which are everything above uh, hydrogen and helium. Um, all those stuff they are produced in the, through nuclear fusion in star, especially elements heavier than iron, they come from supernovas. Uh, or stars that were uh, massive enough to undergo the type two supernova explosion. So, so we have that understanding of um, where all the elements come from, that they come from a, a fusion of um, stuff within the star's core. But there's a bit of um, a mystery, which is that um, our universe is including stars and the interstellar medium, is made of fairly significant fraction of helium. So, um, so you can look at it here. Um, so, so for uh, per 1 million hydrogen uh, atoms, 
there's 80,000 helium atom, which means um, about 8% uh, of atoms are helium. And it falls off very quickly from there. So the um, um, so there's quite a bit of proportion of helium. And if you try to account for this much helium through nuclear fusion that takes place in stars, there just isn't that many. I mean, it's, so, and we see this helium in material in, in interstellar medium that we don't think have ever undergone, um, undergone fusion in a star. It, that's never become a part of a star where it could have been formed out of fusion of hydrogen. So, so this is a, you know, it's a mystery. Why is there so much helium in the universe? And one of the success of um, Big Bang cosmology, the idea that we are living in an expanding universe, meaning we can imagine turning the clock back and imagining universe was a small or more dense uh, and hotter and, you know, keep turning the clock back. At some point it becomes a singularity that's super dense, super hot. Um, thinking of the initial conditions of universe like that, gives a mechanism to um, come think of a nuclear process that could form these uh, helium isotopes that exist in the current universe that were formed in the very early stages of universe's evolution or life cycle or so cycle sounds wrong. We know of only one universe that's only gone through one expansion so far that we know of. Um, but so your textbook section, I think this is the right section. Section 29.3 describes it. And if you, as you carefully read through it, um, this is a theory that worked out uh, during the time of World War II. And uh, um, it, uh, yeah, the guy who, um, so the most famous of the scientists who are working on it were Gamow. And he's um, his famous guy in particle physics. He's uh, known for that. And Ralph Alpher was the young guy who worked at the mathematics. So it was his PhD thesis. And there's a backstory about uh, Gamow uh, uh, adding the name of Hans Bethe, who is um, another particle physicist or nuclear physicist. And uh, the story I remember reading some areas that Alfred wasn't very happy about it because he was afraid. Um, it's a quite common thing in uh, at least the physics uh, for there to be a, a lot, most uh, uh, peer reviewed articles are not written alone. It usually has two authors and um, um, especially for the first author is like a graduate student or postdoc, you know, someone who's not a established uh, tenured professor, then usually the second author or the uh, last author would be the, the professor, the advisor. And it's understood that it's, uh, um, that they're working to it almost like Jedi or Sith, a master and apprentice kind of deal. And um, I guess Alpha's uh, fear might be that when there's uh, three authors that um, people, he could be afraid that people might not recognize that it was mostly his work. And uh, anyways, um, he added that his name, so that it's Alpha Beta Gamma paper. <laughs> um, so in this paper, they work out the Big Bang nucleosynthesis by which we mean, so starting out with um, the protons, that that's the lightest uh, element, lightest particle that would be, uh, that would be present in the early universe and building up to heavier elements. It, um, I don't know if your uh, textbook, yeah, they don't quite, um, um, yeah, so, Yeah, um, so they, they don't quite detail the process, I think, uh, but they do tell you that uh, in this uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, it, uh, it's enough to work out the presence of hydrogen and helium in the early expanding universe before there were any, uh, any stars, before there were any galaxies. And so 
So, um, so what Big Bang nucleosynthesis explains is uh, um, the proportions of these elements. That uh, the model uh, based on this uh, earliest conditions, um, um, earliest conditions um, around uh, here, um, um, when you work out the mathematics, they predict um, particular proportions of isotopes, and that matches um, that matches what we observe in the universe today. And uh, let's see here, evolution of early universe, and yeah, so it's uh, describing the um, from the earliest universe. So this is when the universe was. Um, um, well, well, this figure isn't describing um, the gamma rays breaking up particles, but um, yeah, sorry. Th this figure doesn't really explain anything. I mean, it's showing what we call pair production, production of a particle and antiparticle from very energetic light. And it's describing pair annihilation, annihilation of particle, antiparticle, but um, it's not showing any production of net matter. And th there is a reason for that because um, what we call baryogenesis, one of the things I did want to talk about is um, it's still not completely solved the mystery. Uh, I will, by the end of this monologue, I will tell you um, um, what, what we know so far, what um, some of the, ideas that people have about potential future discoveries. But at this time, it still does uh, represent a time in the universe when we don't know all the pictures yet. Uh, there's uh, some moment in time when um, there's process that should have happened that produces the matter that we have. And now at this uh, three minute time is, uh, that's the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, the process that alpha, beta, gamma paper works out is how um, from the material that were present in the early universe, proton and neutron, um, they would have formed the deuterium, helium-3, and helium-4, and some other processes that produce a small amount of lithium. And, and, uh, and that's the, that's the, that's the initial starting material in the universe the what we I guess have now is interstellar medium um, that we are working with um, some later time some of these um, well I guess much later time um, <laughs> after the things came to uh, so this is the recombination era uh, where the neutral matter could have formed and I think it starts to form much after this and so that's what this figure is describing. And I think the paragraph somewhere here um, um, it points out the significance of that Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, yeah, um, so this paragraph here. Throughout this whole thing, they never use the phrase nuclear synthesis, which is why if you search through textbook, it doesn't come up. But so this is the uh, one of the uh, important um, supporting thing for our Big Bang model, that um, it provides a very neat explanation for something that used to be a mystery, and th and this is something that we like to see in uh, development of a scientific theory that um, that it helps us answer questions that um, that. Um, helps us answer questions that we couldn't answer before. So um, what this paragraph says is still um, the fact that the Big Bang model allows for the, allows the cr creation of a good deal of helium is the answer to a long-standing mystery in astronomy. Put simply, there is just too much helium in the universe to be explained by what happens inside the stars. All the generations of stars that have produced the helium since the Big Bang cannot account for the quantity of helium we observe, about 8% of, 8% um, by count number of atoms and by mass, it's like 25% of the total mass of universe and that's quite a lot. Um, 
Furthermore, even the oldest stars and the most distant galaxies show significant amounts of helium. So we have detected the stars that are 10, uh, 12 billion years old. And um, so those were likely, very likely in the first generation of stars, as in the material that make up the material came from, uh, didn't go through any other star. And, and even they have a significant amount of helium on the outer parts where there's no nuclear future going on. Um, so these observations find a natural explanation in the synthesis of helium by the Big Bang itself during the first few minutes of time. And oh, I guess we estimate that 10 times more helium was manufactured in the first four minutes of the universe than in all the generations of stars during the succeeding 10 to 15 billion years. So, so this is the uh, good summary of uh, um, significance of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And the uh, reason I link to this uh, Wikipedia article is so that, you know, if anyone's interested, you can read more on your own. But, you know, some, sometimes Wikipedia articles go way too much into technical stuff. So, you know, at some point you decide to stop reading <laughs> <laughs> at the point where it stops making sense.